Hello, I'm Václav Kurel. Welcome to the podcast of Carbonec Project. In Carbonec, we aim to return life and carbon back to the soil. And we, we do it by promoting practices of regenerative agriculture. And today we came uh, to the Buffalo Farm in Ohat, which is 20 kilometers from Příbram in the Czech Republic. I'll be talking to the owner, Alex Page. Hello, Alex. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Alex is from UK. He used to work as a high official in the British administration. He participated on meetings with the British Prime Minister and he also worked in Brussels. But once a day, he left uh, that very paired job uh, because in 2010, He, uh, he came to the Czech Republic because of uh, because he fell in love with this uh, beautiful with a beautiful Czech girl uh, called Anna. True, is it right? That's very right. Uh, later on, Anna and uh, Alex uh, got married, and in 2015 uh, they bought farm that had 20 hectares here in uh, Ohar. And since uh, since 2017. They raise buffaloes and produce buffalo milk and cheese. Alex, uh, what did you get here? Why, why did you choose to raise buffaloes? Well, I, as you said, I, I fell in love with my wife when I met her in Brussels. And uh, I sort of had a light bulb moment that I thought uh, working in an office wasn't what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. So I talked with my wife and we discussed setting up a small family farm somewhere in Europe. And the fact that she was from the Czech Republic allowed us that opportunity to move here and uh, find a small piece of land that we could manage and try and do something which would improve social and environmental benefit for people. And why buffaloes? Buffaloes are a very special animal. They're incredibly loving, incredibly giving, and not that they're rare, but they're very different from the other types of farming practices that you see around uh, most of the rest of Europe. So I always wanted to do something slightly different, and coming from an office-based uh, job before, I thought I would try and do something slightly out of the ordinary. And what is the difference in uh, production from cows? Is there like because they behave differently in the nature, the grazing is different or the profit per milk is different? So I, I would suggest that the uh, buffalo ent milking enterprise is a, particularly the way we do it, is a low intensity, low output system. What I mean to say by that is that it suits, the animal suits itself to a regenerative agricultural system particularly well. We were never looking to go with lots of machinery and chemicals and looking to produce thousands and thousands of litres. We're just a small family farm. So we were looking for something that was very different in terms of its offering to the consumer. And a buffalo, if you try and ask, for a high milk yield, you might get 10 liters a day. Whereas I've seen some of the American or Dutch animals where you could, the milking cows, the black and white cows, where you could get 60 liters a day. And I, I, I'm not looking to do that sort of milk production. And then buffaloes also give some really high quality product, great mozzarella, great tasting milk, good yogurts, great kefir. So I think they have a lot more to offer, particularly in our situation. Okay, so you wanted a, that high quality products uh, for you, for uh, your family and for like Czech, Czech people here. So actually I have to say that your farm is the first and the only one Buffalo daily farm in the Czech Republic. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Perfect, well, it's really with your courage. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, you decided to, to do that. Everything worthwhile, I yeah. think, takes some sort of courage to do. Yeah. If it's... And there must be also some you know, like huge investment from your side or from the, from the subsidy, I suppose. That's correct. We 
bought the farm here and it hadn't been farmed, the actual buildings as a, as a single unit with the land and the buildings for more than 30 years since we'd taken it over mm. in, in the mid 2000s. So yeah, it, it required a lot of um, interesting thinking about how to use the buildings. Um, so for example, we're sitting in the cheese room, which is a brand new building, which would have been subsidized and funded from the European money, which comes through the Czech Ministry of Agricultural Rural Development Fund. But we also needed to redevelop the barn, for example. And I think starting from scratch or starting fresh gave us the opportunity to not have the ideal farm because there, there's no such thing, but have uh, the farm set up in a way that would help us manage uh, a regenerative agricultural type of system. So we, we have the grazing very close by, less than 30 meters, and the animals can walk out of the barn. We then put them into the field for a day and we bring them back so we can walk them in and out very easily. Uh, it also took uh, quite a lot of uh, management in terms of how the local farmers perceived us. So, you know, that any change is very uncomfortable for people. And this had always been an arable farming area. So to bring buffaloes into here was one, it, people thought we were crazy. Well, sometimes I think we're crazy, but uh, people thought we were crazy to try and bring them in. And then also because nobody else in the Czech Republic had been milking water buffaloes, um, again, people think that we're quite strange for trying to do that. But I think a, a, any challenge uh, is worthwhile and it, it keeps us fresh. Yeah. Well, actually, you're, you have approximately 20 buffaloes now here at the, in that location. And how did you graze them? What's, what's the practice? Okay, so um, we run our, uh, our animals in two distinct groups. So we were able to get uh, two older buffaloes, a male and a female in the Czech Republic. And they manage the baby group, the teenagers and the babies. Buffaloes by nature are a maternal animal so the, the the female will run the herd and the males in nature would normally be a kilometer away and they would come just for the breeding time it's like elephants yeah almost exactly the same yeah so we we run the baby group um with our oldest female and she's she would be the queen of the whole herd but she quite likes it up there and she has uh, one male that she can boss around and uh, tell him what to do and but they also uh give quite a good education to the younger buffaloes in how to behave when they come into a bigger milking herd. So they make them calmer and uh, you can uh, manage them by hand and brush them and walk around. So there's about 10 in that group at the moment. And then we have a milking group mm -hmm. which has a bull running with them the whole time. And they're in a group of seven at the moment. Now the maternal group, they're away not in the furthest part of the farm, but that they stay outside of the farm buildings pretty much all year round, unless it becomes very cold. So okay. it's again, quite low intensity management for them. And they tend to ranch. So they would have an area of land and they um, continually graze that area almost to destruction. And then we'd move them to the next section. We will in the future be looking to manage them the same way in terms of grazing as we currently manage the milking herd. And the milking herd we manage on a very strict rotational or strip grazing, not traditional strip grazing. We undertook a period of restoration of our grassland with a multi-species pasture, which has some very deep rooting um, species in it, chicory, for example. Uh, some uh, lucerne that goes in there so it accesses the water table. Have you seeded this species? Or? Yeah, we, so I, uh, I took a lot of research from different people and um, there was one particular guy that I've done a lot of research with in the UK and uh, he had this species mix for his grassland. He's on a similar type of soil to so quite dry, very prone to drought, a bit stony. 
And we were looking to get a pasture that every time the buffaloes had access to it, it was fairly fresh grass, particularly for the milking animals because uh, fresh or high quality grazing gives a very good return in milk output. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it reduces our cost, but also gives uh, the highest output we could expect. So we are, in that particular uh, grazing section, we have uh, more than 12 species of um, different grass, birds for trefoil, four, four different species of clover that go into it, three different grasses, um, leguminous crops so that make nitrogen, and uh, this uh, ground breaking or opening up the soil structure, which the chicory does because the chicory root goes down 1.8 meters, so it, it's very good at breaking up the soil structure. This richness of biodiversity in the, the higher spectrum of species is uh, really very important. It helps that the, the total volume of the biomass is much uh, larger. I, I definitely have seen it helping. Yeah, we had a, originally a conversion grass mix, which was just a, like one clover and one grass. And uh, whilst the buffaloes did graze it, they much prefer grazing this. And uh, it's this multi-species also suits itself very well to the regenerative uh, grazing ethos. Eat a third, leave a third, a third would get trampled in. So this species, uh, this, uh, this uh, biodiversity in the grazing area, it really helps in the freshness of grass which comes back again because you have the clover in there and the deep rooting uh, species, but it also, the buffaloes love it. So it fits this system very, very well. So we have a strip that they would go in for probably two days at the very early because we have only a few animals. But as I say, they only eat the top third, and the rest is left. And when we move them on, we find that the regeneration of that grass that they've just left, it happens almost instantly and it retains water into it, moisture. So it's and really how often do you move them? So, uh, Currently, um, we're moving them every two days. So when I originally started the system, uh, it was about every three days because the grass, I needed longer period for it to rest before I could go back in again. But because the grass um, has sort of managed and established itself pretty well, I can go in there a lot quicker. And by the time I get back and we do it about between 45 to 55 days, we would leave it as a rest period till we return back to the same strip that was used at the first. And the rest period is the same? Right? Rest period is the same pretty much for every strip. I try to divide it up equally. Again, it's, it's a learning process, so we've only been really properly doing it for about two years. This, is, this being the second summer of real proper grazing. And uh, yeah, it changes. And also you, you need to be able to be flexible to say, okay, it's not going to be two days. I'm going to only have one day in here and then, but then maybe in a different section, it might be three days. So flexibility and being able to uh, adjust yourself with what you have in front of you is quite a key skill, to, which is again, through learning, that's the only way I've managed. And uh, do you see any change that uh, you see after uh, your trans when you realize the uh, grazing, regenerative grazing, what's the output? What's the change you see? So I, I, I don't have any hard data, but anecdotally, from what I've just observed, we, we have an increase of bird species for sure. Um, probably four or five different species of birds, which I hadn't seen before. So we have those, and then we have more of the birds uh, that we had before, but in, in totality we have more. Because with a grazing animal at pasture, especially in the early evening, you'll, you'll see birds all over the place um, eating the insects which are coming off, the, the, the buffaloes themselves, or the insects which are feeding on the dung and then also because of the multi-species pasture you get a lot different grasshoppers, uh, crickets for example. I mean we have an explosion of those which is great because the birds are, the birds are loving it. Huh? 
And then we, we do definitely have a increase in insect species. No, I mentioned the grasshopper or the crickets. We, we've seen those increase. And the really great one for me, which I have noticed, is water retention and, yeah. and biomass. I mean, that's just... It's absolutely it, critical. I mean, it, and, it, and it's gone crazy for us. I mean, it's fantastic. It's, it's been not so bad this year for us in this particular region or in this particular area on the village. Um, but it, we've still had drought and are in drought. But I, I've got fresh grass every day for my buffaloes to eat. Yeah, and, it's and amazing. Now in the, the very dry summer, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's great. No, I mean, th this year has been the real proof. I mean, last year was incredibly wet, so it was a slightly artificial year. But this year with the drought, which I can see going on into the future, I'm not going to say we've had no problems, but I, I mean, I've got three fields which I need to cut for hay in the next few days, and I, I, don't, I don't need the hay. Yeah. So this is your proof of concept that yes. it works. Exactly, exactly. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, big thanks that you decided for that uh, way of farming and that you do it like, like here in the south, in central Bohemia to increase the biodiversity. It's also very, very important. I think, I think it was one of my major driving um, goals in changing my... Uh, my own personal life from working in an office to trying to become a farmer was trying to help the environment obviously with climate change happening instantly and outside your front window you can see it every day so I, i'm we're not massively driven on the farm by economics we're, that's not our main driver our main driver is providing environmental benefit and social benefit as well. We don't employ anybody on the farm, but the place that we give our products to, uh, so we're direct sellers of our milk, which is, I think, another key goal to small family farms is to market direct to. Uh, so your farm is not uh, the main income for of your family. It's uh, uh, so the economics uh, is not the major driver of your decisions. That's correct, yeah. I mean, economics obviously play a part. I, I, I wouldn't be doing something that lost a huge amount of money, you know, because that would be just slightly pointless as well and, and, and quite stressful personally. But yeah, I mean, um, in, in my previous jobs in, in government, you know, we always looked at the um, triangle of sustainability when we were trying to develop government policy and uh, you know it comes from the 1970s or something but you have a environmental side of it a social side of it and an economic side of sustainability you need all three to be working but i think mainly in our sort of i'm not going to say capitalist system but the system that we have at the moment the economic system we have at the moment people are m more driven by money than they are by the other two and Whilst probably in the past that was similar to myself, I guess I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to think now more about the social and environmental side of what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Yeah, great to hear that. Great to hear that. Yeah. I wish we were more people like you. <laughs> I, I must say I've been very privileged in my life with the job that I've done and uh, the parents that I had and school to be able to put me in that position to, to think slightly differently. Um, and please tell me more about your production. What do you produce? Exactly? Okay, so um, we have, I think, the most at any one time is five milking animals at, at the moment. And uh, at the moment we're not actually milking, we're in a bit of a rest period um, because we're changing from winter milk production to spring summer milk production. Now, now that the regenerative grazing is working, we're changing our um, calving pattern from the winter into the spring to take advantage of the fresh grass. That, that's the main reason, because again, it's the cheapest way of uh, trying to produce milk is on grass. And it's also he much healthier as well. Much, much healthier. And it, it gives a real difference in taste, which is, you asked me what I was producing. So, um, we, we make 
pretty much every milk product you can think of, not everyone, but the majority of them, I, I do them all myself and we're here in my cheese room here, so th this is my little um, experimentation area. I, I, I never made any cheese before I came here. You know? So everything, again, I've, I've learned either from the internet, YouTube, uh, or some Facebook groups, or reading books. And then, again, because I realized I needed to learn from something, uh, we met uh, a guy in Austria who makes great cheese from buffaloes, Robert Padgett's farm down there. So I try to suck as much information as I can from everywhere to help me um, to come up with something. So we started originally with milk, yogurt, um, and some derivatives of the yogurt. So you can make something called labne, which is a, a, a yogurt that's dried and then you can add herbs to it. And so it's like a okay. lucina, it's not the okay. same, but it's like a cream yeah. cheese. Okay. And then um, uh, I made a basic halloumi the first year. Again, a lot of it's to do with my own time, uh, how much available time I have. You know, if I'm milking twice a day, then I have less time. So I made a cheese which was quite quick to make. And then slowly I've been building up the type of cheeses that I make. Um, and what I do is I will make a cheese, trial it with some people. And then once I'm happy that that cheese is successful and I can do it consistently the same, then I'll start to sell it to, to people. So one that is very difficult to make, mozzarella, for example, yeah, which the buffaloes, <laughs> the buffaloes are very well known for mozzarella. <laughs> But actually making mozzarella cheese is incredibly difficult. Yeah, so it's it's very dependent on the pH of the milk and how the pH manipulates over the period of time when you're culturing it. And it takes an awful long time if you do, because I'm trying to do it um, by hand, artisanal, you know, trying to do everything without mm -hmm. machines. Um, it takes about seven hours from start to finish to make mozzarella. So if you manually so yeah so i have to i have to sit here at the i don't have to sit at the machine and watch it but it's about four or five hours to change the ph with culture mm -hmm. and then the manipulation of the cheese to ensure that it becomes stretchy enough to make into a ball uh, that takes a probably a one to two hours and then you've got to clean up and everything so you know if, if i'm milking in the morning and then milking in the evening I don't really have a seven hour spare window in the day to, to try and make something. So I, I make mozzarella just for the family at the moment on a very small scale, the, the mozzarella. But I make the other cheeses, some hard cheeses, um, some... And do it in your, in your plant that maybe in two, three, five years, will you produce mozzarella? I, well, I, I, will, I would produce mozzarella for people now, and people always ask for mozzarella. It's the only thing they ask for, so it's not that I get upset, but uh, I, I would say that there's more to buffalo milk than just mozzarella, yeah, and it makes amazing, I mean, the feta is amazing. And then we make some, trying to make some soft cheeses as well. But again, they take slightly longer to mature, you know, you can have anywhere between three to 12 months in a, if you're trying to make a blue cheese, a great Stilton is an English equivalent, um, like a a Cambazola or Gorgonzola, something like this, uh, from the Italians, um, or a Niva, I guess, is the Czech yeah, equivalent yeah. of the blue cheese. That you could mature that for 12 months, yeah, but then you'd need some investment in cheese storage. So it, it's trying to make things and build up the portfolio of products slowly, making sure that it's always going to be the same quality every time I produce it, because I think that's a slightly important thing for the consumer to. In if they know that they come and buy feta cheese from me, every time they buy it, it's going to be pretty much the same. You know? okay. Or if they have milk, it's going to be pretty much the same milk, or the yogurt's going to be the same every time. But we make ice cream. Really? Uh, yeah. The, again, the ice cream... The, so there are two reasons I personally love it, uh, is, is the, the liquid milk. I just absolutely love liquid milk. Always have as a youngster. And then... Um, Buffalo ice cream, yeah, which is it's gelato, is, is normally. Because buffalo milk, on average, we average about 7% milk fat 
just from the buffalo, yeah, for a one litre of milk, which is very different from the black and white animals. You know, you could be between 2.8 and 3.8. Yeah. Some of the Jersey cows would give you a higher milk fat. But the way that the molecules of fat are locked up in the milk, of buffalo milk, is that they become polyunsaturated, so it's actually healthier milk fat than it would be uh, for a black and white milk cow, for example. And also that would mean that if I'm making a kilo of cheese, I would need a lot less litres of milk to produce the same kilo of cheese. If I was using a black and white cow, I might need somewhere between 10 litres of milk. But for a buffalo, I'd probably need only five to seven litres of milk to make the same kilo of cheese. So. Oh, definitely, I see a potential for many buffalo milk in the Czech Republic. That, uh... we, we don't have a problem selling our products, really. very well. The biggest problem we had was starting people to buy it. And then if we change, so for example, now we're changing the carving pattern, as I mentioned, to get the customers to come back again after three or six months. We're actually going to have a six-month break now to get them to come back is that first uh, reintroduction to the product is always a little bit difficult. But once they taste it again, they, they, they never stop coming. They never stop coming back anyway. So if you, uh, if you are not able to sell your products, is there any challenge that you face, uh, that you, any problem that you need to solve in the following months of years? So we, we, we were very lucky that uh, my wife went on a, um, a special project, um, Bond it was, and it was trying to connect farmers. And she met someone there who does or works for the community supported agriculture um, sort of discussions or groups that go on, uh, mainly based in Prague, but they're th all throughout the Czech Republic. And those people have been amazing. So we, we sell our products to these groups in Prague and they take probably 80% of our product. When, when we're making it. So every week we will uh, deliver some sort of package. We make the package up at the beginning of a season and then a season lasts six months. So I know that in the six months that we're making it, every week I am going to sell a certain amount to these people in Prague. The final 20%, it normally comes through either uh, some local people um, in Pshibram or Pisek that they would take, you know, there's a lady uh, just around the corner. When we're making it, she takes 10 litres of milk every week. I mean, she loves the milk. She, she, I think she works in a hospital, she's a nurse, and uh, I think they get together and each one of them will buy one, one bottle of milk. Yeah. So we get a few people like that. If I have spare product, we don't have a problem with that either because we try to work with other farmers or other people in a slightly barter economy. So uh, there's one lady who's a very good friend of my wife's. She has chickens, so we give any waste product or waste leftover product to her, and she'll give us eggs in return. Uh, we know some people with some pigs, so again, we, we give them some uh, leftover product and they give us some meat back in return. So nothing goes to waste. It, it never gets thrown away. It just gets used by others. So would you recommend uh, somebody who has uh, who plan, uh, plans to uh, have its own farm, would you recommend them to set up a, a buffalo farm, a daily buffalo farm, dairy? I think one of the reasons that, that I under, undertook it is because I didn't know so much about it to begin with. If I was going to do it again, I probably wouldn't have chosen to be a farmer again because it, it's incredibly hard work. Yeah. It's very different from sitting in an office. It, it's much more enjoyable, but I would say the stress is probably worse running your own business. And buffaloes are particularly different from the normal milking cow, so they're, they're quite specialist in, in how you would manage them. So, for example, um, they're incredibly destructive. Uh, so they have a power to weight ratio, for example. Uh, so how much they weigh compared to the output of power they can produce. 
particularly with cars, power to weight ratio. But a buffalo is the power to weight ratio is a four to one. So for, for one kilo, they can produce four kilos of power, which is very different from a normal um, milking cow. They're normally one to two. So for example, I have um, my oldest boy buffalo, the bull, 1,400, 1,500 kilos approximately. So he can push nearly eight to 10,000 kilos of weight. So you need fencing, you know, the pipes that we have in our barn are uh, massive compared to the way you would. So as long as you take that into account and plan accordingly, you're all right. But for example, my milking herd is inside at the moment, as we spoke about earlier, because my uh, bull the, that's running with a milking herd just ripped all the fences out, for example. That's one thing. The other thing is the, a milking buffalo, she can withhold her milk, which is very different from a black and white cow or a normal milking cow. They can't withhold the milk. As soon as they hear the milking machine go or uh, their routine, their oxytocin, the chemical in their head, which the buffaloes have as well, the oxytocin will release and the animal will start to let her milk down. And if you've worked in a big farm uh, of a milking, you probably see the last few animals will already be dripping milk as they come in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? A buffalo can stop, she can switch that off so she can stop letting milk down. And again, it's because of the way that they're very under genetically manipulated recently. And in nature, they would stop themselves letting milk down because of predators and everything else. Yeah. So as, again, as long as you know this, you're all right. But for example, when I first started milking in the first few weeks, I was getting less than half a litre per animal. Uh, and obviously I thought, well, I'm doing something massively wrong. So it's yeah. a good job for a learner, explorer, somebody who... <laughs> so somebody who's interested in learning, yes, who's for sure. Who's interested in learning and who's uh, interested in, in some kind of adventure. Yeah, ad adventure, yes, or craziness. I don't know which way you'd look at it. But and the other thing is that uh, to buy a buffalo, they're incredibly expensive compared to uh, buying a normal milking animal. So they're... So it's not only on your farm, it's not only about regenerative farming, it's also uh, adventure farming. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would never farm anything. Having started farming, I would never farm anything else again. And, and I think I will always stay a buffalo farmer of some sort. Although I need to talk to my son about how long that might go on. <laughs> Says Alex Page from Buffalo Farm Ohar. Near, near Pribram in the Czech Republic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.